Okay, book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 17. We're going to continue what we started two weeks ago. Last week we uh, didn't meet, of course, because of uh, roads not being very pleasant to drive on, that's for sure. So uh, let's start off by reading uh, verses 17 through 19, and then we'll uh, do a little recap and then continue on. All right, he says, so this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that it is them, that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, and they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice a crude kind of impurity with greediness. So we're talking about the new you, I am new, the statement that is part uh, of our identity in Christ. Uh, and we went over the fact that we need to go through the bad before we go through the good. The bad, the old you. You no longer walk as a Gentile. You no longer act as a Gentile. A Gentile back in Paul's day was an individual that did not know God. They were a non-Jew who didn't know who the God of Israel was. They might have heard of them. They didn't care to know about him. They uh, sacrificed the pagan gods, and they were Gentile. So you no longer walk that way. You no longer act that way. You are no longer that individual. And he goes on, because of their futility of mind. Now, futility, and just, just to clarify, uh, it cannot produce anything useful. All right? It means it's pointless. That means your thought process is pointless. It's a futile mind, a futility. There's nothing good in it. All right? It's just, it doesn't produce anything useful. And then they're darkening and understanding. Well, the darkening and understanding is because of the futile, uh, because of the futile mind, okay? Some people will say, well, I've studied, you know, having a futile mind and darkening and everything. Well, my question would be, what was the book that you studied? Because normally the books that are written are probably from authors that also have a futile mind and hence you don't improve anything. The only way to get unfutile, if I even think that's a word it might be, it might not be, whatever, is to read the scriptures. Because in the scriptures is enlightenment. In the scriptures is wisdom. In the light, in, in scripture, it teaches us the fear of God, which is what? The beginning of wisdom. Alienated and ignored, or alienated and, uh, and ignorant is our next portion that we're going to go to. So why is that, though? Well, because we're excluded from the life of God. You see, they disconnected themselves from the God who made them. The source of life and light, truth, they've alienated themselves. That means that they're citizens in another kingdom at war against a great king. Um, I think it was C.S. Lewis who did a wonderful comparison that when we're born and we start off our life, we're under the kingdom of darkness. We live in... Uh, we're not by our choice, but by what, but by what Adam did. Sin entered the world. So as we're born, we're in sin. Okay, so we live in a kingdom in a world of darkness, controlled and governed by Satan. When we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, we become His children. We are in another kingdom. That kingdom is His kingdom. That kingdom is His priority, His rule, His reign. So that's where he has the authority in everything. It means that they wandered away from their homeland. Now, something that always puzzled me or kind of always thought that was kind of cool. When uh, you become a Christian, of course, where you are is where you should blossom for Christ. You should spread the gospel. You, should, you are now a minister of uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ when you accept him because you are now uh, you are now uh, an, an ambassador uh, of Christ. But in all reality, because of Abraham's 
belief in God were grafted in, and we are actual... Now, people say, you know, did you ever hear of somebody having dual citizenship? All right, some people actually have physical dual Some of my family members have dual citizenship. They're citizens of the United States and they're citizens of Italy. I've really thought about it because I think it would be pretty cool just because I can say it. Um, I have dual citizenship. But in all reality, I don't have physical dual citizenship, but I have spiritual dual citizenship, I should say. Okay? I am physically a citizen of the United States of America. But because of my faith and belief in Jesus Christ, I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. I'm actually a citizen of his promised land, which is Israel. Now, I don't have any documented proof other than what that Bible says. And according to the, world's, the world government, uh, that's not good enough. Well, that's their problem, not mine. So when people have this futile mind, this darkening of heart, the, the old us, and Paul's referring to them, he's talking to unbelievers, he's comparing us to them, what we used to be like. We've wandered away from their, from our homeland, and now we're, uh, and now we're, we're strangers. Some of you would say, I'm a good person. I would say, if you're living your life alienated, separated from God, that's the root of all sin. And that's the worst sin you can do. That's the worst sin you can have. To know God exists, to know Jesus Christ, and then say, no, I refuse that. I want to live my life according to me. That is the worst sin of all. You see, because it's like a guy who says, I walked out of my family. I abandoned my wife and children, but I pay my taxes. I don't jaywalk. I live a good life. No. You have abandoned the loving relationship that you were called to, and your whole life since that decision is separated, which means whether or not you do good or bad things, the whole of your life is in the direction of which is wrong. See, when we sin, we turn our back on God. And we live a life alienated from God. And it doesn't mean you're not spiritual. Because you know, many people are spiritual. As a matter of fact, spiritual spirituality is, uh, is what guilty people do to pretend that they're not alienated from God. Paul continues and he says, because of the ignorance that is in them. You see, they don't know that Jesus is God. They don't know what he said. They don't know that he died and rose. They don't know that hell is coming and this salvation is a gift. They don't know. They're ignorant of it. But later on, or if I go back to Romans 10, 14, Paul makes a very profound statement. He says, they don't know because... There's not a preacher to preach. You see, if you expect people to go out and do what everyone in the body of Christ should be doing, it'll never get done. We, as the body of Christ, should proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in all of the area of our life. Not just in word, but also in deed. But it's not that they are just merely victims lacking information. Look what Paul also says, says do their, their hardness of heart. Now, their hardness of heart, the question would be, do you have a heart of heart? You see, when the Bible talks about the heart, it speaks of the heart more than 900 times. It's the seat, the sum, the center of really your being. A heart that's tender towards God says, tell me the truth. I want to change. I want to learn. I want to grow. But a hard heart says, no. <laughs> Just like that. No, it's not what you want. It's what I want. It's not what you think. It's what I think. It's not what you see. It's what I see. You want 
me to change? Well, while we're at it, I think you should change. You see, and that's the heartfelt conversation with God that people have that have a hardened heart. You ever met anybody with a hardened heart? They, inter they, they interpret all data negatively. They always spin it so that they are innocent and you are guilty. They always turn it to where they are a victim and you owe them. And people do this with God. They say, I'm right, you're wrong. You've failed, I've not. You owe me, I disagree. Some people even will go as far as saying something on the, on the ridiculous lines of, you need to change. Maybe even the book that you wrote is wrong. There's errors in it, and it needs to change. And then along comes people, a parade of teachers, non-false teachers, and false authors, and professors, and, 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 and wayward pastors. And they say, well... We've decided that futile minds and darkened understanding, that leads to good income. Because there's a huge market for those with hardness of heart. See how that works? Believe me, it's real. It happens. Is your heart hardened toward God? Are you angry at Him? Are you frustrated with Him? Then Paul also adds, they have become callous. Have you ever become callous on anything? And if you play guitar or an instrument, work hard with your hands, and you know it's a it's a point in your in your skin that constantly gets pressured, and then you get a blister, and then eventually you gain a callus, a section of your skin that is really hard. It doesn't hurt anymore, the part that used to be sore, because it's become callous. And they have become callous, as Paul says. You know, when I started doing this, it really bothered me. It doesn't bother me that much anymore. I used to feel guilty after I did that. And now maybe God's okay with it because I don't feel guilty anymore. Huh. No. That's not correct. It's not that God's okay with it. It's that you've developed a callus. You've become dead. I mean, a callus is, as I understand it, oftentimes, literally, just a collection of essential dead skin. Is there a dead spot on your soul to where that doesn't hurt anymore? It doesn't bother me. I'm not convicted by it. I don't want to change. I don't want to think it's wrong. Maybe it's not a big deal, or maybe God doesn't care. Well, see, he does. You're just calloused. You're not going to change there. You'll say things like, that's the way I am. It's not the way you're supposed to be. I need to be true to myself. Can I tell you that's not a good idea? Being true to oneself is false. That's a lie. Calluses can become, calluses can be built, I'll say it this way. Calluses can be built because of desensitizing. A, desensita a, a, desensitize, a desensitive uh, process can build a callus. The entertainment world is perfect for desensitizing. If you were to go back, um, I think about it. I'm, not gonna, I'm probably going to get dates wrong. But I remember, I, 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 I remember talking to in, uh, an individual, or it might have been in a, in a message or something. I want you to, something that you really need to know. Satan is patient. If he's nothing else, he's patient. Okay? Because in his deceived mind, he wins. Okay? The deceiver is being deceived by his own deception. I'll tell you that right now. Okay? <laughs> So he believes he wins. So he's patient. 
I'll say a name, I'll say a couple names here, and, and, and I'm pretty sure everyone will know those names. And I'm just going to use the entertainment world, okay? Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley was on the, uh, he was on a show, and they wouldn't go where on the, the camera. They wouldn't go below his hips, his waist. It was the Ed Sullivan show. Why wouldn't they go below his waist? Because of the way he danced when he sang. It was sensual. But at that time, they wouldn't do it. Now, the first bedroom scene in a television series, the Dick Van Dyke show, two beds separated. Whenever they wore night coats, they were buttoned to the top, full length. Where was the first bed that was one bed? The Lucille Ball show, I believe. No? They later changed it to two, two separate beds. The Lucille Ball show, but there was one bed at one time. So it's a process of desensitizing. And it's a process as that desensitivity happens, you become callous to it. Fifteen years ago, can I go fifteen? I'll go twenty. Go twenty years ago. How much gender would have been on the television? There would have been two genders on the television. How much um, relationships would have been on television, meaning homosexuality and all that stuff? Not very much. But in today's, it's everywhere. It is every day. It's a desensitizing. It's becoming a callous. Paul goes on and he says, and have given themselves over. Now, I'm going to lead from that right into this, because when you become hardened of heart and become callous and you become desensitized, you do this because what's wrong with it, right? Have you just ever just given up? Have you just thrown your hands up in the air and said, I'm done? That's it. I can't win. I might as well join. You're like, you know, you know what? I'm just going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to think this way. I'm going to justify myself. I'm going to vindicate myself. I'm going to explain myself, excuse myself. You know, I, I am the victim here. How many of you have heard that or you've done it yourself? Keep that answer to yourself. I don't need to know. You might have heard maybe teenagers say, well, I'm a teenager. I've just given up. Or I'm in my 20s and I'm given up. I'm in college. I've given up. You know, we're newly married. Yeah, we yell at each other. Yeah. But, you know, well, just had kind of now it's a hard season we're going through. Just sort of given up. Ah, a midlife crisis. Yes. Oh, I get to give up there. Not that I just want to, I just give up there. We give up and we give in. We give in to all kinds of sin and temptation because we've just given up. And you have to ask yourself, is that you? If so, You'd have to question yourself whether you truly can be calling yourself a Christian. You see, God knows your heart. I do not. But if you're hearing this list saying, wow, that sounds familiar. You see, I want you to remember, Paul is referring to non-Christians. He's saying, if you're a Christian, don't walk as the Gentiles do, because this is how the Gentiles walk. And he's going, we're going through that list. <laughs> So he's referring to non-Christians here. 
Truth be told, Christians can fall into some of these habits and behaviors, but a Christian is the one who still has a tender heart and says, I know it's wrong. I want to change. I'm not right with God, and things are bothering me. For the non-Christian, they're callous, like it doesn't really bother me. So, I just continue to do it. But then he doesn't give up there. Paul says, they've given themselves over to, uh, look at what they give themselves over to. Sensuality, greedy to practice impurity. See, we, we highly evolved, haven't we? We're, you know, we're, we're the, the people that Paul's referring to or as we're reading about his time, they're like four or so back on the evolution scale or, you know, they kind of look different, right? And yeah, we're 2,000 years later. So we've evolved, we've advanced. We all went to college, we studied sociology, psychology, uh, psychology. we got degrees, we got self-help, we got spirituality. We've highly evolved. No, we're not because you know where it ends up. They're naked, greedy, and doing naughty things. Sound familiar? Naked, greedy, doing naughty things. That's it. Because you know what? Oftentimes, it's not that people don't know the truth. It's they don't like the truth. The truth. That, and, that, and that is the truth. If I, if I was to tell a drunk driver, hey, you know, you're, 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 you're driving drunk and there's a cop right up the road. It's not that he won't believe me that there's a cop up the road. It's the fact that he doesn't like the fact knowing that there's a cop up the road. He doesn't like the truth. So when we read stuff like this, when we go through scripture like this, we have some people who say, well, I don't like it. But see, that sounds sort of rebellious. And so what instead they say is, well, I don't know if I believe that. I have a different ideology. I have a different philosophy. I have a different spirituality. I have a different perspective. I think maybe it's primitive. You know, new psychological insights indicate, new sociological insights indicate, new anthropological insights indicate that this is very negative. This is negative speech. This is a negative teaching. This is not very tolerant and diverse. This is very judgmental. You know, this is very critical. This could really hurt someone's psyche. Imagine what this would do to their self-esteem. God forbid, because we all know that self-esteem is the source of life. Yeah, this is hate speech. This is intolerance. The people who hear this, they were very offended. It's become a, you know, a real news story. Some of the you know, professors and, and scholars and, and scribes indicate that this should be outlawed because in an intolerant, diverse, pluralistic society, these kinds of things are fairly antiquated and offensive. So what do they do? They put Paul in jail. What do they do with Paul? Well, eventually he dies. He gets killed. And they did it. And what do you do? And, and, and what uh, do you want to do with this? Hmm. You see, this is offensive. Can we just even, uh, just even disagree with everything I've said? Can we now agree that it's fairly so, this I say and I affirm together with you, if we look at this all-encompassing from, from, from verses 17 through 19, 
and, and, and just examine it together because I've been breaking it down. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk. And this is where he's pointing to the Gentiles and saying, this is how they walk. In their futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluding from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, and they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. I don't think Hallmark's going to grab a hold of that one and put that on a birthday card and say, Happy Birthday. I know what you're thinking. I don't see myself like that. Well, that's what I'd expect from a Gentile with a futile mind, a darkened understanding, alienated from the life of God, marked by ignorance, hardness of heart, and callousness. And I did put the extra nisses in there just for the fact of emphasis. And the horror of it all. Some might say, I don't see myself that way. But you should, because God does. You see, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter what I think or what we think about ourselves. You see, we're not going to die, stand before a mirror, and give an account with an eternal consequence. We're going to die and stand before a righteous judge that is God. Who is God? And he's going to render a verdict as to how he sees who we are and what we've done or failed to do. You're not going to stand in front of someone else. You are standing, you will stand in front of God. Righteous, majestic, truthful God. That's why we truly need to live our lives in the Latin term that's called Dio. And that means before, before, before God, in the presence of God. You see, is this the direction of your life? Is this the way you think? Is this the way you act? Even right now, are you thinking, why did I come today? Why am I listening to this today? I disagree with this guy. I want you to know, you can feel free to disagree with me all you want. I would say, don't disagree with Paul. Because see, that's bad news. That's very negative. Where's the hope? Where's the happiness? Where's the joy? Where's the encouragement? Can I tell you, none of that is in me, and none of that is in you. You know who that is in? In Christ, in the Beloved, in Him. That's where your identity is. That's where your happiness is. That's where your joy is. That's where your encouragement is. That's where your forgiveness, your freedom, and your justification is. That's where your sanctification is. It's in Christ, in Jesus, in the Beloved, in Him. That is your identity. Because there's nothing righteous about you or I. There's nothing good about you or I. Yes, were we Gentiles? Were we pagans? Were we alienated and had darkened mind and futile of mind? Yes. But that's not who we are anymore. We have the light of Christ in us, living through us, moving through us, with the power of the Holy Spirit, glorifying Him in all areas of our life. Let's pray. Father, as we go forth, I pray, Father, that you would give us the strength determination and the perseverance to go forth to proclaim you as our Lord and Savior. And Father, as what we have as we call the old man or the old person that creeps up in our life, Father, give us your strength and your might to not accept who we used to be. But we are in you now. We are in Jesus Christ, our identity through that, we know what we need to do. To glorify you, to honor you, to worship you. And to spread your gospel, the good news, 
throughout this world. Allow us to stay humble in you. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, go forth as your ambassadors, as the body of